Good afternoon, Marysville Rotarians. What a pleasure it is to see you. Can you see me? Good. I was known as Stephen J. Field, Marysville's first elected official, the man who employed the whipping post to preserve the peace of the fine new city of Marysville, the man who wrote all its laws, and most of the laws of the state of California, for that matter. Ultimately, Abraham Lincoln appointed me to the United States Supreme Court, where upon my retirement, I was its longest serving member. Now, now I'm just an old ghost. You literally can't touch me, especially through Zoom. I guess you could call me a ghost in the machine. <laughs> but, um, okay, Chuck, uh, quit playing around. Uh, you want to bring me into better focus? Uh, I've been asked to talk about Christmas past. Yes, yes, I read the Dickens version. I was alive when Charles wrote it. And I'm not going to tell a sappy tale about acts of beneficence by the money class at Christmas. No, my story's about Christmas past in the great American West, even long before the railroad connected the two coasts of our great nation. I'm not going to tell the story about the time Marysville forgot to invite Santa Claus to the parade, nor am I going to tell the story about the time Marysville was saved that on Christmas Eve from drowning in 1955 by members of Beale Air Force Base. And, and I'm not even going to tell the story about the time that uh, Mary Murphy married Charles Covalot on Christmas Day in 1848 at Sutter's Fort. No, I want to begin and end my story in 1846. It was a big year for Christmas, 1846. Christmas had been celebrated in many countries for centuries. But 1846 is central in the creation of two of its most popular contemporary traditions, the Christmas tree and the Christmas card. It was in 1846 that the magazine Britain Illustrated published an engraving of a fir tree decorated with candles and bright paper at Windsor Castle with the Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, and their children surrounding it in excitement. Prince Albert has been credited with popularizing the Christmas tree, expanding on a German tradition of decorating tree limbs in the hallways of homes at the holiday. Each year, another picture of Christmas at Windsor Castle circulated around the Western world, and within 20 years, it became customary to have a Christmas tree in many homes. Also about this time, also in Victorian England, a gentleman in London began putting drawings and sayings on cards at Christmas time and shared them with his friends. In 1846, two American printers saw the commercial potential of passing out happily decorated cards at holidays and started the production of what is now the multi-billion dollar Christmas card industry with more than three billion cards sent each year in America alone. Keep note, Mr. Parrott. So that should give you some sense of where we were in the celebration of Christmas as, as California was about to undergo drastic change with the gold rush. Now, I know things are really rough this Christmas with the pandemic and all. What I would like to suggest, what I hope you get out of uh, my visit here today is that this pandemic can't cancel Christmas. Christmas comes from within. And it comes out even under the most trying times. One of the things I learned in the West was just how severe life can be. I was a gentleman from the Northeast, always willing to turn the other cheek in a land that was lawless. Among men who were not afraid to challenge you unreasonably. In fear, I had special pockets made uh, for a waistcoat large enough to carry cock and fire pistols without removing them from the pockets. Men were not above devious means if they felt insulted or slighted. One year in Washington, D.C., I received a package mailed from San Francisco to my office at the Supreme Court. I mistook it for a Christmas present from my in-laws, but I had not opened the package too far when I realized it was a crude explosive device. I took it as a bit of a Christmas miracle I hadn't been killed. 
disease was rampant in the West and often unchecked. I myself came to California from New York in 1849, going the overland route across the Isthmus of Panama to Panama City itself, where throngs of people were waiting to catch ships to California in the gold fields. Malaria broke out. I caught a ship in the first week of December. That's how my first Christmas in the West was aboard a steamer ship bound for San Francisco, burdened by some 1,200 people on a boat built for half that load, nursing the sick who were sprawled out on the deck. Hmm. It was a bit of a Christmas miracle. I didn't catch the disease myself. We finally arrived in San Francisco on December 28, 1849, and I ultimately found my way to what was to become Marysville. In January of 1850, I participated in the founding of Marysville and in the decision to name it after Mary Murphy Kovalod, wife of one of the largest property owners in the region and a survivor of the Donner Party, a wagon train that became trapped in deep snow at the summit of the Sierra Nevada mountains on Halloween night of 1846. The first rescue party did not arrive until February of 1847. There were approximately 90 members in the wagon train and almost half the party died of starvation. Under such dreadful circumstances, how could Christmas possibly come to what we now call Donner Lake in the winter of 1846? The members of the Donner Party were trying to reach California at a time when the United States and Mexico were at odds over the future of the state, and America had sent its naval forces to the Pacific Coast. At Monterey, a Congregationalist minister and chaplain for the United States Navy was appointed Alcalde, the chief local official of Monterey by the American military. Oblivious to the suffering of Americans trapped at Donner Lake some 200 miles to the northeast, he enjoyed a Christmas celebration unlike any I've encountered. He described in a story he called Christmas in California 1846, the scene on Christmas Eve that year as the sun set on Monterey. The bells rang out a merry chime. The windows were filled with streaming light. Bonfires on plain and steep set up their pyramids of flame and the skyrocket burst high over all in showering fire. Children shouted. The young were filled with smiles and gladness, and the aged looked as if some dark cloud had been lifted from the world. That night at his home, the Alcalde, uh, Walter Colton, who went on to found the very first English-language newspaper in all of California, was serenaded by a troop of musicians playing guitars and violins, accompanying actors portraying shepherds, angels, the devil, and a hermit with the holy book and lash that he flogged himself with and sometimes others. So here we have an American in California enjoying a Christmas celebration that stands in stark contrast to the experience of those who were snowbound at Donner Lake, where prospects were so appalling that it is hard to comprehend how the spirit of Christmas could possibly pierce the dark veil. As their supplies dwindled and their crudely constructed cabins became encircled with snow, they slaughtered their pack animals, gnawed on leftover bones, and even boiled the animal hide roofs of, the, of their cabins into a foul paste. About half the party would eventually die of malnutrition. Many would manage to subsist on morsels of boiled leather and tree bark. Conditions were so desperate that, on December 16th, a group of ten men and five women, all in snowshoes except 13-year-old Lemuel Murphy, younger brother of Mary Murphy, left on her lake with enough food for six days each to cross over the summit and down to the Sacramento Valley in an attempt to alert those who were unaware of the predicament of 90 Americans trapped in the snow. It was a long shot. That's why they got the name The Forlorn Hope. But most were parents, leaving their children behind in the hopes of saving them. Over half of the members of the Donner Party were children under the age of 18. One of those children, Virginia Reed, would write 40 years later, The misery endured during those four months at Donner Lake in our little dark cabin under the snow would fill pages and make the coldest heart ache. Christmas was near.
but to the starving, the memory gave no comfort. On Christmas Day, 1846, at Donner Lake, Patrick Breen, who kept a daily diary, reported that it had begun to snow about noon the day before. Snowed all night, and snows yet rapidly. Great difficulty in getting wood. Offered our prayers to God this Christmas morning. The prospect is appalling, but hope in God. On Christmas morning, the members of the Fort Alone Hope woke up in a circle under a tree, their feet touching, covered by blankets, which were themselves blanketed by snow. On this morning, the members of the party, which, which included Mary's sisters, Harriet and Sarah, and Sarah's husband, were without food, and Lemuel and others in the party were near death. Within 48 hours, Lemuel Murphy would die under a bright moon on a clear night as he was being held tight by his sister, Sarah. Within hours of his death and the death of others, the decision was made to harvest the bodies of the dead so that members of the Forlorn Hope could continue down the hill to rescue those at the camp. Only seven of the original 15 just two men, and all five women, made it to Wheatland. After 32 days in the snow and with the assistance of some mighty rescuers. All that lay ahead of the forlorn hope as they woke in that circle Christmas morning. Back at the lake, the Christmas spirit was about to move in a profound display of foresight and love. Margaret Reed had four children, and weeks before Christmas, even as food supplies were dwindling fast, she was determined to set aside the fixings for what, considering the circumstances, could only be considered a feast. A few dried apples, some beans, tripe, and a small piece of bacon, all wrapped up and buried. Virginia Reed, the oldest at age 13, remembers the squealing of all the children when the mother unearthed the hoard and began making Christmas soup. You could just imagine the children watching the cooking very closely. Virginia, nine-year-old Patty, six-year-old James, and even four-year-old Tommy, clustered around the kettle Faces bent closely to smell the unexpected feast. The cabin filled with unaccustomed sounds. Children's noise, excited for the prospect of a Christmas miracle. Virginia recalls, When we sat down to our Christmas dinner, Mother said, Children, eat slowly. For this one day, you can have all you wish. Of course, there wasn't plenty for all. But in that cabin at that moment, there was plenty of Christmas for the Reed children. So bitter was the misery relieved by that one bright day, Virginia later wrote, that I have never sat down to a Christmas dinner without my thoughts going back to Donner Lake. I want to leave it here. It was the story I just told an indication that even in the darkest of circumstances, the question of where are you, Christmas, can be answered. So Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Season's greetings to everyone at Marysville Rotary, and thank you for allowing me to be your guest today. Now, if Chuck knows what he is doing, I'll be right back to answer any questions you have. Uh, that is if we have time, Madam President.